I am going to uh, base the talk today on um, my new book um, on trafficked children and adolescents or adolescents and youth uh, who have been trafficked to the United States. And I want to uh, start by introducing you to um, this young woman, to Evelyn Chambo. Uh, she's the only protagonist in the book whom I name by name at her insistence, because uh, she has uh, crafted herself as the abolitionist and an advocate, so she wants her name to be known and um, she wants to be in the thick of it. Um, so here it is. Um, I'm going to read from uh, the prologue to the book just to introduce you to some of the themes that I want to talk, to, uh, uh, talk about. So it was a crisp fall afternoon um, a couple years ago. I was waiting in front of the Silver Diner in suburban Maryland to meet Evelyn. Several years older than when I first met her uh, and interviewed, Evelyn has not lost her exuberance. Pushing her 10-month-old uh, son in a stroller to the restaurant where we planned to have a late lunch, Evelyn smiled and waved um, as soon as she spotted me. With one hand holding onto the baby's stroller, she used the other arm to envelop me in a warm hug. Evelyn is a survivor of domestic servitude. For two years, she lived in her trafficker's house in Greenbelt, Maryland, completely isolated from the outside world. She was not permitted to speak to, with anybody, go to school, or even answer the door. In the late 1990s, Evelyn's mother and uncle sold her to Teresa Mubank, um, an acquaintance of Evelyn's maternal uncle, to settle a very old, um, that nobody anymore remembers, uh, land dispute in Cameroon. Mubank brought Evelyn to the United States when she was barely 10 years old. Mubank, a naturalized U.S. citizen, traveled on an American passport, but Evelyn used fraudulent documents to cross international borders. Uh, Evelyn thought she was coming to the United States to fulfill a childhood dream of attending an American school, but the reality was very different from the life that she imagined watching the Cosby Show or the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, if you are familiar with American shows. Uh, instead of the idyllic life of hopping on a school bus every morning, uh, learning English, making new friends, and so on, Evelyn was forced to care for Mubank's small children around the clock and perform never-ending household chores. When she was allowed to rest, she slept on the floor. Uh, if her cleaning was not up to Mubank's standards, Evelyn was beaten with an extension cord or locked up in a basement without food. Mubank's son urinated of Evelyn regularly to humiliate her. When she tired of beating Evelyn, her captors scratched the girl. If ever there was a poster child for traffic minor, Evelyn is it. Uh, Evelyn's body testifies to the physical violence she endured. She has really significant scars and burns to remind her of that ordeal. A decade after she escaped, it is still difficult for Evelyn to recount not just the scars on her body, but also, and maybe even more so, the verbal abuse that Mubank wielded as skillfully as the rod she used to discipline her. However, the insults, the cruelty, and the violence did not squash Evelyn's spirit. Throughout her ordeal, Evelyn refused to give up. She persisted, day by day, with a defiantly hopeful outlook and a head held high. When the opportunity arose, Evelyn escaped. She found help, first from some distant relative, um, and then from the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, LIRS. Um, in the early 2000s, when Evelyn was nearing her 13th birthday, the U.S. government, the federal government, officially recognized her as a trafficked child. She was now, therefore, eligible for federally publicly funded uh, services. Um, so help was on, the, uh, on its way. She was grateful to LIRS, to the foster auntie, uh, and especially to her pro bono attorney, Melanie Orhent. With Orhent's uh, expert legal um, assistance, Evelyn received a special visa. The U.S. anti-trafficking policy um, provides for two types of visa. The T visa, which allows people to be on the path to citizenship, or a U visa that allows them to stay in the country as long as the uh, law enforcement needs them to testify, to do whatever. Uh, 
It allowed her to stay in the country. She was placed in foster care and she was able to uh, attend school. Throughout this lengthy process, Evelyn observed Melanie, uh, who at the time was a managing attorney at an NGO called uh, Break the Chain Campaign, helping other victims rebuild their lives. Melanie's passion and dedication inspired um, Evelyn. During our first interview sometime in the 2006, Evelyn told me that she wanted to be just like Melanie, to advocate on behalf of trafficked victims, participate in anti-trafficking activities, and lead support groups for survivors. To be very uh, truthful, um, I was a bit skeptical <laughs> uh, about her ability to accomplish that goal. Uh, Evelyn has, however, proven me wrong, uh, and I stay corrected. She has achieved her dream of becoming a self-described activist against modern-day slavery. She speaks at events for Break the Chain campaign, collaborates with a network of survivors, um, a nonprofit organization which supports survivors, is led by survivors. She recently went on a retreat um, with a group of young women who had been trafficked for sexual exploitation, and she said that she drew strength from the retreat and hoped that sharing her own story of domestic servitude was helpful to the other women. Evelyn's strengths manifest itself, itself in many different ways. An excellent student in Cameroon with a strong yearning to learn new things, Evelyn was told over and over and over again that she was dumb, dirty, unworthy, and that she would really never amount to much. Though she struggled in high school a lot um, in America, these ins insults did not prevent her from pursuing her dream of attending college. While her spoken English was passable, I did the interview in English from the get-go, uh, she was illiterate in written English, obviously. She was illiterate in her own language, um, well, semi-illiterate, because she was a small kid who just started schooling in Cameroon. Reading, writing, and solving math pro problems posed sometimes what seemed to be insurmountable uh, challenges. Discouraged, she dropped out of school, but not for long. She enrolled in something that we call in the US GED, General Equivalency Diploma or General Education uh, Diploma Program. And after getting her diploma, went on to earn an associate's deg degree in social work from a local community college. With a new boost of confidence, she enrolled in an online um, undergraduate baccalaureate um, program in Homeland Security at the University of Maryland. She graduated in 2015 got a college diploma. Strong and determined to succeed, Evelyn continues to show incredible resiliency in the face of adversity. Unfortunately, her life, although now it's been several years since her um, escape, uh, she, her life is not free of struggles. Um, a few years ago, a stranger on the street raped her at gunpoint. Uh, she thought that she would never be able to trust a man ever again. Yet a few years later, she found a loving partner in Malcolm, the father of her son. Their son, Molima, my heart, as his father calls him, is the center of Evelyn's and Malcolm's lives. Evelyn and Malcolm are engaged to be married, and they are very hopeful for a good family life. However, a few clouds still overshadow Evelyn's happiness. For a long time, she could not understand why her mother sold her to a stranger. How could a mother sell her own blood and flesh? Uh, the inability to understand her mother's actions weighted very heavily on her, and she fell into clinical depression. She thought that the only way she could shake off that feeling was not by talking to her therapist, but to confront her mother. With the help of an older brother living in Europe, Evelyn saved money for an airplane ticket in, and in 2012 went to Cameroon. Evelyn shared with me excerpts from a journal she kept while she was visiting her family. She left her homeland a little girl of 10, taken across the ocean by a stranger, but she returned on her own terms, a young woman of 27. Although bitter about her mother's involvement in her trafficking, Evelyn was extremely startled by her own joy and excitement in seeing her mom. Tears ran down both of their cheeks as they hugged for the first time in almost two decades. Evelyn's mom would not let go of her daughter, even when Evelyn's siblings came to embrace her. Surrounded by family members, mother and daughter held each other for over an hour. 
A few days later, after visiting her mom and then her dad, Evelyn finally uh, went to see her maternal uncle, a man she used to call father. Burdened by the thought of being treated as chattel, Evelyn confronted him, and looking him in the eye, she wanted to know what role he really played in her trafficking. At first, he minimized his role and said, oh, well, I merely arranged for Muban to take you um, to, the, to the United States, but later admitted that money changed hands. Fearing that other people in her hometown might treat their children like disposable goods, Evelyn spent a few days organizing meetings and speaking to parents mm, and civil society groups about child trafficking and its effects on young victims. Ever the activist, she hopes that these discussions raise awareness about trafficking in children. Today, Evelyn is not free of economic difficulties. Recently, she lost her job as a security guard. It was one of those he said, she said uh, type of stories. My word against my coworker's word, she told me. The company let her go. Unfortunately, Evelyn did not qualify for unemployment benefits. Puzzle, puzzling, I'm not quite sure how she was hired. As a result, her fiance is now the sole breadwinner. An artist from Cameroon, Malcolm has to supplement rare artistic commissions with a job as a manual laborer. They try to economize as best as they can, but some days they go to bed hungry. Evelyn is ill-prepared to understand the intricacies of networking and job hunting in America. She wishes that the programs providing assistance to survivors of child trafficking focus less on mental health counseling and more on employment services. As we finish up our lunch, Evelyn says she has faith, however, that things will improve. Things can only improve. They cannot ever get worse. Um, I do not doubt that Evelyn will persevere. Afong is Evelyn's middle name given to her by her grandmother, and Afong means strength in the language of Evelyn's childhood. So let's, let's hope. I use Evelyn um, and the prologue to really introduce the main themes of, um, of my research. Um, um, and that is trauma and, and resiliency in survivors of child trafficking. Um, because Evelyn's story is quite representative of the resiliency and perseverance that countless survivors of child trafficking exhibit. But it also is very unique because she is a unique individual, so she also deals it with, uh, with it um, in her own a little way. Like the whole idea of you know, getting money and going off to um, confront her mother. Very few people can be that uh, resourceful. Um, it also represents the vulnerabilities and calamities that do not always disappear while, once victims escape or are being rescued. You know, we always think, oh, well, okay, let's identify as many um, um, traffic victims, let's extricate them out of that situation, and things are going to be just terrific. Well, as you heard, you know, she, she had been raped. Nothing that ever any woman ever wants to experience, right? She is struggling economically um, because she's not as well prepared to, um, um, to, to look for jobs and that kind of stuff. So there's many things that are still unresolved. Going to bed hungry is not something that we wish you know, for anybody. Um, however, the focus on resiliency and survivorship in my research rather than on trauma and victimhood um, I hope signifies a departure from the uh, prevailing public discourse and um, about trafficked children and, and youth that is, you know, sort of Dickensian um, in its uh, expression. Um, and, and those kind of stories inform policymaking. So I wanted to look here at, you know, juxtapose the two, not denying one, but showing that there is both resiliency and uh, drama and trauma, that there is survivorship as, you know, and, and victimhood mm, as well. Uh, journalists and service providers usually, uh, you know, um, because those kind of horrific stories sell in newspapers, um, but usually uh, present um, victims as uh, hapless victims forced into the trafficking situation. Um, 
never an agent, never an, an actor with a great deal of volition, often willingly participating in the decision to migrate. Um, so with an emphasis on agency in this research, I hope to give the young people a voice and allow them to ascribe their own meaning to the mm, trafficking uh, experiences. Um, because I wanted to understand the social world that matters to them um, as they you know, try to rebuild their lives in, uh, in the US. And what mattered to them the most was what matters to every one of us. Get a good job, be able to send money home, hmm, you're fr coming from a poor family, uh, learning English, developing French friendships, finding love. You know, those are normal human desires. Um, in this research, I also try to juxtapose the programmatic responses based in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, which is the major legislation in the United States, that is based on the principle of the best interest of the child with the young survivors' perceptions of their experiences and service needs, because they knew, knew what they really needed. They didn't necessarily need somebody else to tell them um, what they should be doing, could be doing. Um, so I explored in this, re in this project the tensions between the adolescents' narratives um, of their trafficking and the actions and discourses of foster care programs, child welfare programs, you know, policy makers, both in the federal government as well as state governments and, and local agencies. The former are grounded in culturally diverse conceptualizations of childhoods, and the la latter are based on a very Western, Eurocentric, middle class ideal of what it means to be a child and what, it mean, uh, and what childhood should look like. My aim in this project was to contribute to the unfolding discourse on human trafficking that takes the more agentic and a harm reduction, reductionist kind of an approach that maybe you are reading some of these authors or following some of these blogs, you know, people like Laura Agustin, Denise Brennan, Elizabeth Bernstein, Julia O'Connell-Davidson, um, Pardis Magdavi, Svati Sach, and uh, Carol Vance. Um, I engage in that research, you know, uh, theoretical questions about children and childhood's agency and vulnerability, trauma and resiliency, and that kind of stuff. But the, the real aim was practically, you know, what can we do? How to reconcile the gap between what the young people thought of these experiences, wanted, um, and how they wanted to recover from that violence and from that horrible or ordeal, and the notion um, you know, within the notion of agency and survivorship and the institutional responses at different levels that, uh, that were based on the notion of vulnerability, victimhood, and a great deal of dependency on adults. Hmm? So, now let me say everything clear so far? Do I have any questions? Okay. Now let me say a little bit, just a few words about doing this kind of research and writing about child trafficking. Uh, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I'm old and gray-haired and have been a social scientist for 30-some years, and I really have not seen in any realm of social sciences such an empirical vacuum. Uh, where you know, policy making at the international level, national levels, and local levels would be uh, made without a reference to some empirical data. Yeah. But just a bunch of usually what? White people sitting in a room, right? Or at the comfortable chairs and thinking up stuff uh, without really much of a regard of, of what's going on. So methodologically and practically, you know, research with survivors of trafficking is not a piece of cake. It is a difficult, challenging thing, you know, and, and you've heard these uh, arguments probably over and over. Oh, well, you know, it's a hard to um, research population, hard, hard to access population. Oh, those traffickers, you know, uh, keep everybody chained to a bed or, or a chair or something like that. Some of it might be true. But at the same time, 
we have an illustrious history of studying hard to reach populations. Think about drug addicts, think about criminal justice, think about homeless, hmm? domestic violence victims. Hmm? So somehow we know how to do this or we have tried many different approaches, but I'm not seeing the transfer of these kind of methodological approaches and frameworks to this new field, as if this field was so different from anything else that you know, we shouldn't even try. Same with theories, you know. Um, I mean, trafficking ultimately can be about migration, and in many instances is about migration, and yet, um, I haven't seen much in literature of uh, thinking, well, what of the migration theories fit this? You know? uh, so it's, it's a very peculiar uh, kind of a way. And at the same time, you know, I don't know in your respective countries, but in the United States, every department, and I mean every department in the federal government, wants to have the piece of the, of the action and wants to do something on trafficking instead of thinking, well, you know, wh where do I look for inf really good information, good data? It's the same with, you know, all these estimates. I, you probably have noticed also that, you know, even the trafficking in persons r report, the tip report, the infamous tip, tip report that the sheriff of the world, i.e. my government, uh, <laughs> issues every year, that they stopped um, including estimates. Well, you know, first the estimates were like mind-boggling and, you know, every one of us is trafficked and all that. Now it's silent. The only numbers that they put forth are pr maybe prosecutions for different countries. And I wonder why is it, why aren't we worried or bothered or attempting to use methodologies to estimate um, hard to count populations. You know, if you look at Jeffrey Passell, he has had a very good methodology that he's been using for years to estimate what the undocumented population, uh, undocumented migrants in the United States are. You know, and we trust his stuff. Uh, you, everybody cites him and everybody you know, uses it. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, some of those challenges. Um, the other challenge relates to this perception that um, these young people and adults as well are extremely vulnerable and therefore the service providers that are in charge of protecting them uh, from feather exploitation um, guard them uh, and I've written several times that guard them almost as much as the traffickers used to guard them. So access is a very difficult um, issue for that reason, not because we don't know where they are, but because they are you know, very protected. And I don't want to be less fair here and say that you know, anybody from the street should be allowed to come to a program and interview anybody that they little heart desires, but the, there should be some understanding and some dialogue between service providers and researchers to, say, to talk about the empowerment that research also entails. Because, you know, if you're a young person, or even if you are a very old person, uh, aren't we all um, flattered? And doesn't that do something good to our ego uh, if somebody's interested in what we have to say? Mm? So there is a therapeutic element to research that is totally um, kind of um, uh, overlooked or, um, or, or not whatnot. You know, the service providers usually will say, well, you know, um, never mind that the young child, the young person should be bringing about social uh, justice or should be bringing about social change. That is the role for the pro bono attorneys, for the advocacy community, not for, uh, for the survivors. I happen to disagree with this because I've seen in, among refugees, among other all sorts of migrants that that can be extremely powerful and that you know uh, migrant led organizations can you know do uh, all sorts of things we i mean just whoever we are um, we don't like others to be telling us what to do, right? We want to be in charge of, <laughs> of what we want um, um, to accomplish and that kind of stuff, but somehow this is not happening here. So um, 
I'm going to skip a little bit, but you know, as an anthropologist, I've also reflected on this research as doing anthropology. So if you've ever taken an uh, uh, introduction to um, cultural anthropology or any anthropology for that matter, um, you know, you heard about, the, do I dare say, Malinowski, yeah? Bronisław Malinowski. Um, his work is the, the sort of, you know, um, highlight of, of what it means to be doing um, anthropology and ethnographic work, you know. He was stuck on the trio brands for five uh, years because as a Polish subject, um, Poland was fighting Austria, right, in World War I. So he really had no place to go <laughs> unless he wanted to serve in some army, usually probably would have to be the Austrian army because the, the part of the Poland that he came from uh, was under um, Austrian occupation. Um, so in this kind of work, you cannot mimic that. You cannot have that prolonged engagement because there's no such thing as a community of survivors of trafficking. You know, we cannot look at Budapest and say, okay, so where, where might they be? You know, let me go to the neighborhood. Let me um, see if I can chance upon somebody, if I can do you know, participant observation. None of this is possible. You have to really do what in anthropology we call mobile field work or unsighted ethnography, uh, that you are not really looking at one uh, kind of uh, place. So I spent several years really following uh, 140 kids. Um, you're going to say, oh, well, you know, this is a small sample. How can she generalize based on that? At the time when I started that research, this was the universe. There were no other identified um, young people or people who had been trafficked before they turned 18. So this was it. Uh, if you're going to, I'm going to preempt one of the questions that I always get because people think, well, so how did you choose them? How did you um, decide that they were trafficked? I didn't. My job was very easy because the federal government, the US federal government, identified them, gave them the status of a traffic victim. And if you ever read my book, you will see that some of the stories, you know, people questioned, were these youngsters really trafficked? I had four girls, for example, all the way from China, whose trafficking in the jargon of the uh, immigration uh, officials was preempted, meaning that they were apprehended at the border. So nothing bad within the United States yet happened to them. You can argue whether, you know, schlepping somebody uh, who is 14 through many continents and uh, many countries is doing harm or not. You know? So that's a, a, that's a different story. But they were not um, forced to labor. They were not forced into sexual exploitation. They were rescued at the border. Um, but still, because of the young age, uh, were uh, designated as, um, as trafficking. So to get out of this you know, um, fraud with many challenges kind of research situation, what do you do? You got to collaborate with the people that work with the youngsters, with the service providers. So the, this kind of a collaborative uh, effort, because my team was also composed of uh, some of these providers, met with some severe criticism. And people were saying, well, you're not objective. Uh, it's really not such th no such thing as objectivity and the truth in social sciences, right? There's always somebody's point of view. Um, but I, I could not have done it without it. Um, I would not have had any access to that. Um, but it, so Despite all of this, I still call the study an ethnographic study because the kinds of questions that I was asking were very different from the questions that the pro bono attorneys or the therapists or the social workers were asking where they had a very much predetermined framework into which they wanted to put the answers to these questions. Well, I was like, you know, uh, let's see what the young people tell me and use the grounded theory to get the insider's point of view, whether I was talking to the youngsters or whether I was talking to the service providers. 
you know, I didn't have a, a particular agenda except to say to uncover the insider's story. Um, I also, um, have it here. Yeah, on terminology, a couple of, of things on terminology. Uh, in the literature, you always hear women and children, trafficked women and children. Okay, so who are the children? You know, so I use here different kinds of words to really, um, you know, and use them deliberately to differentiate between age groups, to recognize the principle, remember from the uh, Convention on the Rights of the uh, Child, right? There is the concept of evolving capacity. Uh, and we talk about it. Um, somehow in this field, we conveniently forget it. Um, to, to differentiate you know, the, the levels of agency, of course, a five-year-old does not have that, as much agency as a 17-year-old. But if you want to um, create a policy, if you want to do good programming, you've got to be differentiating between those. I use the word minor. Um, in anthropology, it's a very frowned upon word because minor means like you're lesser than I am. But um, legally, um, it's, a, it's important to use it, so I use it um, because in the eyes of the law enforcement, especially with whom they interfaced so much, um, they have not attained the age of majority, no matter what the age of majority in the country of origin might have been. Um, so I feel like you know, it's a good thing to be doing this. I also use the word survivor. I, I understand it's not a perfect term, but I think it's better than victim. Uh, as you've seen from Evelyn's story, you know, she survived the worst ordeal, but she continues to struggle. So, you know, being a rape victim is, of course, being victimized as well. But um, um, I, I understand, for example, the legal necessity to use the term victim in some circumstances, because when you think about uh, um, you know, national policies um, to be eligible for services for immigration relief, uh, those kind of things. Uh, the young people, or the pro bono attorney rather, uh, have to prove that they are victims of crime, of trafficking, right? So it's a crime. Um, so th as the money that is set aside for these services also comes from a pot called victims' services, you know, um, and that kind of stuff. So that's, that's fine, but why do we need to transfer that label to the more therapeutic kind of, you know, and cultural environment? Is it, I ask the question, is it therapeutically good to continue to be called a victim? And what does it do to us? Think about, you know, when you're sick and you go to the doctor, right? <laughs> How different we are in a doctor's office when we are this poor patient as opposed to somebody who has a great deal of agency and can, um, and can make, uh, make decisions. I use the, the term child trafficking, although just, I, I just now harped on the children and <laughs> adolescent things. Again, simply because they are being considered survivors or victims of child trafficking because the abuse, the exploitation, all of these had to happen um, before they were eight, before they turn 18, according to the. In the research, I also followed these, the the policy framework uh, that is you know called capture, rescue, and restore, and we could have a whole lecture on just un, um, unpacking these uh, things, but I'm going to uh, skip that. And but let's start with the capture. So have you seen the movie Taken? Almost everybody's ever seen the, the movie Taken. So in that movie, Liam Neeson plays a retired government agent whose daughter Amanda, on vacation in Paris, is captured by two mobsters who are running a prostitution ring. What follows, very predictably, is a frantic father on a transatlantic quest to rescue his daughter. In reality, trafficked children are rarely kidnapped. Parents traffic children don't have to search for them um, because they know exactly where they had taken them uh, or whom they paid to smuggle them and where. So there is not, none of this uh, unknown. Trafficking scenarios do not follow Hollywood movies, uh, scripts, and don't ever be persuaded by it. Um, 
trafficked children also do not live privileged lives and full of expensive gifts and so forth. Um, the youngsters um, that I studied, uh, without exception, came from very poor families, although from different class. I had a few girls from Mexico who came from middle class, but something happened and, and the family was extremely poor. Um, it was varied levels of education and that kind of stuff. Um, but they were expected, all of them, to contribute to the livelihoods of their families. Um, but the opportunities to do so, you know, in rural Mexico or Guatemala or Morocco or Cameroon or China were far, uh, were few and far between. The, the nearby towns and, and cities where they would go first, in, in most cases, also had very limited options. So the United States seemed like the El Dorado, right? Like the better idea uh, to go there. So families uh, consulted coyotes or snakeheads to facilitate uh, border crossing. Mothers and sometimes grandmothers took the risky journeys with the mm, girls to provide them either with better education or employment, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, many of the girls in my sample were mothers themselves. You know, there were teen mothers who had toddlers and whom they couldn't feed. You know, so that, that was another motivation. They might have left the child with their own mom or grandma uh, back there. Um, they, you know, so there was this, this element of volition and an element of decision making, right? They wanted to do that. Um, if you're a 17-year-old mother, you probably have a pretty good idea what's in the best interest of your baby and what you, want to, what you must do in order to provide for the kid um, and that kind of stuff. Uh, they obviously, when they were making the decisions back home, either in conjunction with their parents or somebody else, um, they obviously had no idea what would await them. You know, the, we always imagined migration to be <laughs> very romanticized, you know, um, streets paved with gold and the rest of it. Um, so they had no idea that they might be exploited, that bad things might happen to them. But moreover, in many instances, they did not perceive the things that did happen to them as really terrible. Uh, and, you know, we always have a point of reference, right? When we compare, when we evaluate anything, we always compare it to something. So in this case, it was a comparison to the poverty, to the lack of education, to the lack of many things that they faced at home. So by the maybe middle class U.S. standards, they were in horrible shape. Uh, but by their own standards, they were not necessarily. So that, that ne we, we need to be thinking um, about that. Um, the, the other kind of theme that appears um, in these debates is that, uh, you know, it's always um, criminal networks, mafia, organized crime that is responsible for it. Um, I, I am not denying in this research that there can be uh, involvement of organized you know, crime and some mafiosos and all of that. Amongst the 142 kids here, I had no proof whatsoever that anybody else but uh, family members, friends, boyfriends, <laughs> um, or and I'll give you an example of a stranger, uh, were involved, but those were isolated people or you know, small groups of people that um, were facilitating that, um, that um, journey. So were they parents or traffickers? You know, once the kids were, the young people were rescued and the police got involved, the NVI, whatever law enforcement, ICE, you know, <laughs> immigration and, and customs enforcement, they would always say, oh, you know, handcuffs, handcuff the mom, the grandma, the kid sees, the young person sees the grandma or the mom being dragged off in a uh, paddy wagon or whatever, mm, because they were always conceptualized as the trafficker, while to these young people, they were the helpers. So I'm, I'm going to give you an example of uh, Flora and Isa. Flora was very, when I first met her, she was very guarded talking about her family because her mother and three other members of her immediate family were convicted of luring 
that's the language from the case files, of luring some 30 young women, including the 15-year-old Flora and her twin sister, Isa, from Honduras to Texas to work in a cantina that the family owned. Neither Flora nor Isa, Isa thought they were trafficked. Neither one of them vilified their mother. Fro Flora felt that her mother had done nothing wrong and did not understand why she was arrested and incarcerated. In order to further uh, exonerate her mom and grandma, Flora reported that she was not being made to prostitute. I was simply working as a waitress, she told me, and dancing for men when they requested it. She did, however, give a full description of the bar to the immigration and customs officers, who used this information to convict six of the nine relatives involved with the establishment. In an interview with my research team, Flora said that she did not want to tell on her aunts and uncles, but felt very intimidated by the agents and thought that she had no choice, as she put it, and had to tell them something. Hmm? Uh, the court notes um, that I looked at reported that Flora was in danger of retaliation from some of the relatives involved in the family trafficking business who remained at large in Honduras. She laughed at that and said, I'm not afraid of my uncles. The, I've known them all my life. There's, there's nothing that is dangerous about it. Another girl, Melinda, expressed similar feelings about her mom and her um, um, grandmother uh, who trafficked uh, also from Honduras uh, several girls to New Jersey. Melinda had difficulty accepting that her mother, who was an evangelical pastor, um, and her abuela, grandmother, had engaged in illegal activity and was devastated to learn that as a result of her testimony, the US law enforcement um, put both women, uh, incarcerate, well, collaborated with the Honduran authorities, and both women were incarcerated in Honduras. The, she told me, um, you know, I wish they just deported her because most of these youngsters were very familiar with deportations. Many of their family members had been deported not once, but twice and many times. But to imagine your relative, your mother or your grandmother in jail, you know, they thought, well, only like murderers uh, go to jail. Um, so they thought that the solution, they understood that smuggling people across the um, international border is an illegal activity and it's punishable, but the severity of the, of the punishment was something that didn't really um, uh, sit with Melinda. Her social worker said to me, moving towards acceptance of this, you know, that the mom and grandma were guilty, has been a major advancement for Melinda. It took her a long time to say, okay, you know, by US law, that's, um, that's how it is. Um, when, um, when parents or family members were involved in the smuggling, because all of it started as smuggling, um, the, the kids thought, well, they're just helping them. You know, many of the girls were saying, look, um, if you, they all asked me, do you have a daughter? And I said, yes, I do. And they would say, well, what would you do if your daughter needed something? Would, wouldn't you help her? Right? So they perceived all of this as helping. Um, not as, um, as uh, uh, wrong things. And let me say something about strangers, because I classify a couple of, of the cases as being trafficked by, by the strangers. But um, I put the word strangers in parentheses because unlike Amanda in the, in the movie, uh, none of these children were kidnapped or whisked away by people whom they never met before. So in this case, the only case in, uh, um, in my study that involved um, a couple dozen boys, all Peruvian boys from the same neighborhood in Lima, um, were trafficked by strangers, not biologically related to them, not somebody that you know lived in the household or, or anything. But these traffickers befriended these young boys and set up you know, recreational activities in the neighborhood, volleyball and all that kind of stuff and worked towards uh, establishing some sort of a rapport with, um, with these kids and then, um, um, and then uh, convinced the parents uh, to let them take the, these young people to the United States. In certain instances, the parents or some adult from the family uh, went as well. So, you know, 
these kids knew these strangers for several months or maybe over a year, uh, so it wasn't you know somebody that would just open the door and just took one of us um, uh, from here. So the question uh, was, you know, um, were these friends or foes? You know, how do you classify them? Um, were the traffickers benevolent? Or did they kind words mask sinister uh, intent, I was asking. The youth definitely thought that the people who smuggled them across international borders were helping them. Many, uh, as I said, many of the youngsters understood that the coyotes and the snake he heads were breaking the law, but at the same time did not think that they victimized them. If they felt wrong, um, and se several of them did feel wrong, it was by the employers mm, who didn't pay them as much as they hoped to or made them work long um, hours or that kind of stuff. However, you know, the law enforcement, of course, saw all of this, um, those involved in the uh, youngsters trafficking as part of, as I said, of the international mafia. This was all illegal and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the, I wrote there that the police officers and ICE agents in particular often do not recognize that the children and youth migrate um, or are smuggled partly to seek out economic opportunities to support their families. So they don't see it as a broader uh, migration of children because we're imagining and policymakers in particular have this I don't know where they get that image from, but uh, the children always, or youngsters, you know, under the age of 18, always migrate uh, in the shadow of parents or guardians or, you know, some adults. Well, what we know um, from the recent crisis, right? When you see on TV, well, there's plenty of the so-called unaccompanied children, the 17-year-old Syrian boys, um, and off they go. Um, same you know, in, in the United States, um, 16, 15, 17 year old Mexican um, young men, because I would not dare call them boys, they would punch me in the face most likely, um, think this as a, um, as a rite of passage to go El Norte and you know, to seek employment. That's what young men, uh, adolescent men uh, do. And yet we don't look at it, um, you know, the, the excessive focus on migra migratory processes that are imposed um, um, may lead to a very erroneous uh, assumptions that all forms of child migration are necessarily exploited. They're not. Uh, you know, I, I can give you example after example of kids that crossed international borders, went to school, uh, you know, yeah, no pass to citizenship, but that's a, a, little, uh, a little different. Um, but the, the, the notion by policymakers and service providers is, you know, that, oh, but they were lured, but they were duped, but, and if the parents were involved, oh, the parents are greedy parents. You know, some of that language is very interesting to look at because it's, it's kind of a discourse that we don't use to describe other social phenomena. Um, the the no, child advocates that I interviewed often forgot that the majority of the 140 plus were all the adolescents, usually between 14 and 17 years of age, and they also have disregarded the fact that, for example, the Fair Labor Standard Act of 1938 uh, accords children between the age of 12 and 16 the right to work in certain industries for limited numbers of hours and that uh, kids that are a little um, older can work full time in non-hazardous forms of labor. So, you know, there are policies on the book that allow for that, but we, at the same time we think, oh well, a youngster working, this must be a bad thing. And I always uh, uh, think about my students, you know, um, can think about you as well, think about it when you were in, gra in uh, high school. Didn't your parents want you to work on the weekend or you know, after school? We want young people to get work experience, to manage time, to manage money, to manage many things. And yet we use 
for the other child that is not part of our community, very different, um, very different uh, standards. So it's always when children work, um, it's always exploitation. Um, I already uh, mentioned the, um, that some of the girls were mothers. Um, you know, this all also goes to the idealized childhood. And again, you can be looking at historically at where all these historical antecedents um, are, but this is, you know, Dickens again. Um, um, you know, it's 19th century England uh, where all these benevolent societies spring up. Um, trying to rescue children that were really in bad kind of conditions. Uh, but in this, if you read that discourse, it's very similar. It, nobody is talking about the Industrial Revolution and you know, how the bigger, than, larger than life forces affected what kids were doing or not doing, um, but always uh, talking, oh, the parent is the culprit. The parent doesn't take care of the child. Same now. We are not conveniently forgetting, for example, the role of the United States government in why all these Central American kids are coming through the southern border. You know, we are forgetting about what the local national governments of the countries of origin have not done to protect these children. Yeah? So the discourse is very different. It's not should be more politicized, and it's more like oh, you know, bad parent and, and that kind of stuff. Or, on the other hand, you have that organized crime, but nothing in between, you know? either bad family. Uh, early on in, in the field, a lot of people were hypothesizing, it's like a strange hypothesis, but I played with it. Um, and we're hypothesizing that maybe the kids that are being trafficked are the kids that are marginal in some way to the family, you know? So the kid that doesn't, is not a good student. The kid that was sort of an, you know, the, the last kid and is yet another mouse to feed. None of this uh, panned out in, in, in the research. Um, it was actually oftentimes the kid that was the smarter, uh, smartest, the kid that was the most resourceful, that the family thought, well, you should go because you will do really well, you know, and not um, somebody that is not uh, of that kind of stuff. Uh, so just to end, because we're at 50 minutes, uh, so, so just to end, the, the other concept that comes from the legal arena is the, uh, in the best interest of the child. So in the courts of law, we always you know, look at anything, any, any social divorce, uh, you know, custody, that kind of stuff. The judge will always say, I'm going to do things in the best interest of the child. But from the legal arena, that whole concept is now also in schools, in social work, you know, that kind of stuff, where, again, there is a disregard for the evolving capacity for the kid to participate in the decision-making what's in their best interest. You know, and here it was the same, that everybody was saying, no, 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 she doesn't know it. You know, she lost her childhood. She needs to recoup her childhood. There was this imagination without asking that most of these girls were really sexually victimized, and they were not. One of, uh, one of the young women said to me, you know, wearing a low-cut blouse does not a slut make, um, and definitely not a prostitute. You know, they had very different, perhaps, very different um, standards of fashion than maybe I would want for my 26-year-old daughter, you know, or when she was even younger. But, but so what? You know, who am I, the fashion police, to be <laughs> saying that? Yet, the police, and especially, um, w were judging and t then telling the social workers in the programs, oh, well, you know, I found her in a bar and look at the uh, skirt she was wearing. I am sure she had been raped over and o over. And then the, the services were being designed to um, um, serve that, per, uh, that kind of a victimized person. Why the girls were saying, why are they thinking that? No, yes, I danced with men. Yes, I sold overpriced drinks, you know, and smiled and wore a lot of makeup because that would bring really good tips. 
but I didn't sleep with anybody. I could if I wanted. In, many, in some instances in the bars, the, uh, the young women were saying yes, if uh, there was no pressure, but if I wanted to go you know, upstairs, they said, if I wanted to go upstairs with the client, I could have made more money. Some did it, but some not. But yet there was this blanket assumption that all did, and therefore the services had to be designed uh, to it. So just to, to end, so now you're thinking, what happened to these people? Um, <laughs> I wondered the same thing. So I wrote an epilogue in the, in the book, but it was very hard to write it. Uh, because there's really no resources to follow these young people mm, after their eligibility for services ends. Once they get the status in the United States, once they get the status of um, a trafficked victim, they are eligible for exactly the same services that refugees are um, eligible. So there is seven months of assistance that they can get, but after that, you know, uh, like that. So only the programs that provided also social uh, legal aid in addition to social services were saying, you know, we stay in touch or they stay in touch with us because they come to adjust their legal status to the green card then to citizenship. Um, under that um, status, they can also bring the unmarried siblings, you know, the small children, maybe a parent, you know, that kind of stuff. So those programs knew a little bit more. So I'm happy to uh, report that, for example, the Peruvian boys all of them uh, have done really, really well. And I ask, well, what do you think you know, happened? Are they just exceptional um, or something like that? One of the, or two of the women, old, um, adult women that were trafficked with them, um, kind of took on the, the, the motherly, <laughs> if you will, in your role, and they had that kind of support. They also had the support of the congregation because they were being served by Catholic charities and, uh, uh, you know, in a very uh, Spanish-speaking kind of a, a community, so um, they got all the support. Uh, some of the girls did well. One, Melinda, the one that I mentioned, Melinda um, wants to be a beautician, so she's working as a hairdresser and, and is saving money to open her own salon, uh, for example. You know, a couple went and finished high schools, a couple went to what we call community colleges, which is a two-year uh, you know, kind of a community college. You can um, get a little diploma. But the, the bottom line is that, you know, us, um, so, uh, uh, policies are being refined as programs are being, um, you know, continue to be designed. We really know very little long term because mm -hmm. I did a glimpse uh, over a just a few years and then some of them, but we don't know that. So, so that's the gap in the money. You know, there's no money to do that, uh, that kind of a follow up. They don't have motivation necessarily to go back. I mean, one of the service providers, and I kind of bought that <laughs> line of thinking, said to me, you know, since they're not coming back to us, that means they must be doing okay. Because they know where we are. And, you know, if, if there was some calamity, we would be, uh, our doors would be knocked on. So I, I don't know. I, the optimist in me wants to believe in that. That cynic in me thinks, well, you know, maybe they're being re-trafficked and we, um, again, don't know. So we'll stop here and um, I am happy to answer whatever questions you might be. And Julia's going to help me moderate. <laughs>